For a character that's been a mainstay in American pop culture for over three quarters of a century, it doesn't seem like the Joker's popularity has waned one bit. On the contrary, Mr. J seems to be in the spotlight today in ways he never has been in the past, making frequent appearances across many mediums such as movies, comics, television shows, and video games. If anything, we are seeing an ongoing resurgence of the character, a new golden age of the Joker, if you will. It's quite an interesting fact to note that in another 20 plus years or so, the character will be a century old, yet it still feels as if he's something we're not overly familiar with. But how could that be? Why does it feel this way? Could it be the fact that the Joker in and of himself is such a mystery? Is it because the very nature of the Joker is so out of the bounds of societal restrictions and normality? There are so many possible explanations as to why the Joker remains so fresh and relevant, not only in America, but internationally as well. I, personally, would like to think that a very palpable answer to that question lies in the fact that there is such a monumentally vast assortment of source material to pull from. He's a villain that has seemingly had countless incarnations, none of which being any less legitimate than the other, but all sharing a common theme, madness. And as far as his live action film appearances are concerned, two names have pretty much been burned into our common psyche, Jack Nicholson and Heath Ledger. Both actors were critically praised for their portrayals of the Clown Prince of Crime, with both interpretations, thankfully, being very dissimilar from one another. Nicholson's was more of a psychotic, fun-loving gangster, while Ledger's was definitely a more serious and brooding terrorist adorned in messy grease paint. The late Heath Ledger even went on to earn a posthumous Oscar for his anarchist rendition of the character in Christopher Nolan's 2008 epic, The Dark Knight, the second installment of Nolan's highly praised Dark Knight trilogy. Ledger's portrayal of the Joker would almost immediately go on to become the most infamous version of the character, as far as live adaptations go, with his performance remaining the active talking point of the character for years and years after The Dark Knight was released, up until it was announced that a new incarnation of Mr. J was set to appear in DC's Suicide Squad, the third entry in the, at the time, newly established DCEU, or DC Extended Universe. There was, of course, immediate buzz surrounding the news, and the internet exploded with speculation. Who would play the part? What source material would the actor be deriving inspiration from, and what would he look like? It was revealed soon thereafter that Oscar winner Jared Leto would be taking on active Joker duty, apparently diving headfirst into the character, and outspokenly determined to not emulate the fantastic work of his predecessors. In spring 2015, Suicide Squad director David Ayer treated us to our first official publicity photo of this new version of the Joker, an iteration unlike anything the public expected. Needless to say, massive controversy erupted around the whole ordeal. It became apparent rather quickly that fans were extremely divided, with many criticizing the look, saying it was too, quote, hot topic, too riffraff, too scummy. Others, however, embraced the change of pace, instantly taking to blogs, posts on social media, meme creations, etc., all to show their support of Leto and this new version of the Joker. The big question, as always, 
was how this new portrayal would turn out. After all, this is one of the most beloved characters of all time, so the stakes for Jared Leto were extremely high, especially considering he was the first actor to portray the villain in a live-action adaptation since Heath Ledger's infamous occupation of the Clown Prince of Crime. Huge shoes to fill, to say the least. But this was Oscar winner Jared Leto. He couldn't let us down, right? Right? Well, it wasn't until the reveal of the Comic-Con teaser over a year before the actual release date of Suicide Squad that we would get a small taste of things to come regarding Leto's Joker. I'm just gonna hurt you. Really, really bad. In addition to being a great trailer that was dark, brooding, and seemingly anarchic in tone, the brief glimpses of our new Joker brought a sense of relief to many, with Jared Leto's portrayal obviously aiming for a very dark and disturbing version of the character. Naturally though, for a lot of Batman fans and Joker enthusiasts alike, the jury was still out on Leto Joker. As far as I could tell, the big concerns among everyone was how this version of the character would relate to the established DC Extended Universe, a world where Batman and his rogues gallery had already been active for over 20 years, including this Joker. Unlike Ledger's Joker in The Dark Knight, Leto's version was not a new threat in Gotham. Leto's Joker had been active in Gotham for decades. Further expanding on the suggested history between Ben Affleck's Batman and Jared Leto's Joker is a grim and brutal plotline lifted directly from comic book lore. This Joker had murdered Jason Todd, the second Robin. I know some of you are probably thinking, well, we've seen other Jokers kill people too. And yes, that's very true. Rachel Dawes being blown up in the Dark Knight, gangsters being electrocuted to death in Batman 1989, and so on. But there's just something so incredibly eerie and disturbing about seeing Robin's empty and tattered suit on display in the Batcave in Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, discolored and adorned with crude Joker graffiti, a grim reminder of how lethal, volatile, an unhinged Leto's incarnation of the Joker truly is. With Jack Nicholson's Joker showcased as the playful gangster version of the character and Ledger's as the chaotic anarchist, I was extremely hopeful that Leto's iteration would be a darker, more frenzied version of the character. Perhaps something not unlike the Joker seen in some of the weirder and more abstract graphic novels and one-offs throughout the years. But even if this did turn out to be a game-changing performance, would the collective fan base ever truly be able to look past Leto's physical appearance as the Clown Prince of Crime? Because for those who hated the idea of a tattooed Joker, the concept of ever accepting this inked up weirdo was taboo to say the least. But these issues were surface level based entirely on visual aesthetic, right? Surely a powerhouse performance from Leto could change everyone's mind, regardless of how he looked. I mean, look at Ledger, for example. A similar situation regarding visual aesthetic happened when his Joker was revealed to not have bleached skin at all, but was in fact purposely donning clown makeup to scare people. This wasn't something Joker fans had ever really seen before. And that, similar to the situation with Leto's tattoos, had the fans heavily divided at the time, until The Dark Knight was finally released, showering Ledger's rendition of the character with universal acclaim ever since, and rightfully so. But could Jared Leto pull the same thing off? Could he turn taboo into glory? Audiences had to wait until August of 2016 to find out for sure. But luckily, in the meantime, we were treated to several trailers and TV spots that showcased the kind of Joker we would be getting, the Joker of the new generation, and the official Joker of the DC Extended Universe. Finally, the time had come. 
August 2016. The universe that began with 2013's Man of Steel and continued with Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice would now, for better or worse, continue with David Ayer's villain-heavy Suicide Squad. As the lights went down in theaters across the country and we saw that grungy, neon-spattered Warner Brothers logo, we held our collective breaths and watched. It became quite clear, right from the release of the film, that moviegoers were extremely split on how Suicide Squad turned out. I personally can't recall any other comic book movie creating such division between the fans. I mean, there was the uproar surrounding the announcement of Keaton as Batman back in the 80s, and the hilarious ridiculousness of Schumacher's Batman and Robin, but Suicide Squad seemed to actually offend people, and not necessarily for being an offensive movie in and of itself, but for being so different in tone from what the initial trailers had seemingly promised. The film ended up being more in line with the goofier vibe of the final two trailers, which disgusted a ton of viewers and outright ruined the experience for them. So many people absolutely hated this film, and I mean hated, despised. But on that note, there were also a ton of people who unapologetically loved the film. Two extreme ends of the spectrum, without much of an it was okay crowd whatsoever. You either loved or hated 2016's Suicide Squad. Personally, I fell into the category of those who were downright thrilled with the film itself. I loved it. I thought the performances of the actors were on point, the storyline was abstract yet easy to follow, and very comic book feeling to say the least. The music, both the original score and the contemporary soundtrack, fit the tone of the film almost perfectly. The cinematography was lush and beautiful. The editing was fantastic. I mean, I loved every minute of this movie. I honestly couldn't understand what critics and fans alike didn't like about it. I saw the film excessively in theaters as well. Nine times or more to be exact. And that's not even an exaggeration. And each time I went, I was still excited to sit down in that dark theater and enjoy the ride, even though I knew the film's composition in and out by the second viewing. I think that's why I kept going back to see it in theaters, in particular, the 3D IMAX showings, is because the film is a ride, through and through. It's a really fun experience that we don't really get very often these days, almost never it seems like. I kept trying to see what the critics were talking about when they berated the film, and I just couldn't seem to find much that I didn't like about Suicide Squad. Perhaps having Enchantress as the film's final villain was a misstep. That's probably the one thing I don't like about the film, to be honest. But even that grows on you. With everything said and done, whether you loved or hated Suicide Squad, there were two things that had people on both ends of the spectrum talking. Harley Quinn and the Joker, played by Margot Robbie and Jared Leto, respectively. I'll save the discussion of Robbie's performance as the clown Princess of Crime for another time, because I think she was completely fantastic in the role and deserves her own discussion elsewhere. But for now, let's turn our focus back to Jared Leto's Joker, the one character out of the film's entire ensemble cast that had everyone talking, even more so than Harley Quinn. Now, let's briefly run through the two Jokers that preceded Leto's not counting any of the animated content or TV shows or movies that came before 1989's Batman. But the two tentpole movie jokers, and this isn't to discredit or take away from the performances of Mark Hamill or Cesar Romero, or any others for that matter. They were all fantastic in their own right, and I realize many people place them at the top of their own Joker hierarchy lists. But when I say tentpole jokers, I'm speaking exclusively towards the live action movie jokers. And there's only really been four or five of them over the last 30 plus years. Batman, The Dark Knight, Suicide Squad, Joker, and for a very brief cameo, Zack Snyder's Justice League director's cut, which is still Jared Leto, but a very different version. There was also, more recently, very, very briefly, 
a cameo by the Joker in Matt Reeves' The Batman, where he goes unseen but heard in the theatrical cut, but appears in a pretty long scene with Batman himself in a deleted scene that was released after the film came out. But that's besides the point. When Jack Nicholson played the role in 1989's Batman, he was more or less a combination of classic Cesar Romero-style Joker and Jack Nicholson being Jack Nicholson in Joker getup, which is amazing, and I wouldn't want it any other way. I mean, Jack Nicholson is the Joker in real life, right? Mix in a slightly darker, more aggressive demeanor, and you have Nicholson's fully fleshed out gangster, or mobster, version of the character. A very fun portrayal, but would I deem it as the supreme rendition of the character? I'm not sure. Maybe. But again, not entirely sure. My question is, is there really such a thing as a supreme rendition of the Joker anyway? There's so much content and source material to pull from that it seems virtually impossible to have any one version of the character considered to be the staple, right? Right? Enter Heath Ledger's Joker. This rendition of the Clown Prince of Crime received worldwide critical acclaim and became, for all intents and purposes, the iconic Joker for the modern day era. Unlike any iteration of the character that came before, however, this version was not a product of falling into a vat of chemicals and being reborn as a cackling, bleached skin madman. On the contrary, Ledger's Joker, from a character standpoint, willingly made the physical transformation into Gotham City's number one supervillain by donning crude face paint and adorning his existing Chelsea grin with vibrant red lipstick. Ledger's Joker was very much a product of America's own dilemmas and anxieties regarding the war on terror at the time. A character created by what was happening in the Middle East and one alluding to the post 9-11 fears still very much resonating within the United States. This Joker was a full-blown terrorist whose only goal was to create a state of anarchy within Gotham City, using chaos as a means of doing so. This is the role that won Ledger his posthumous Oscar and redefined the Joker for a new generation, solidifying Heath Ledger as the Joker for the 21st century. The question was, could this Joker ever be topped? And finally, the focus of this video, Leto's Joker, the official Joker of DC's extended universe, and as I've said already, the figurehead of massive controversy among critics and fans alike. He preceded Joaquin Phoenix's non-DCEU Joker and reappeared briefly in the previously mentioned Justice League Snyder Cut several years after the release of Suicide Squad. Leto is probably the most controversial Joker in Joker history. But why? Was it because he was so grungy and, for lack of a better phrase, spring breaky? <laughs> was it the tattoos? Was it the smashed out teeth replaced by silver fillings and crowns? Was it the voice? Was it the acting? Was it the laugh? Or was it all of the above? Again, I very much enjoyed Leto's Joker, but many among the Batman fanbase are still extremely angry regarding Leto's rendition, especially considering it is, or at least was, the Joker of the DCEU. I guess it really depends on your opinion about what's going on within the DCEU itself these days. But when it comes to Leto's Joker, Perhaps the masses would have rather had a more traditional and classic Joker, like Nicholson's, as the DCEU's Joker, or maybe something more along the lines of Ledger, or maybe something in between. It's very possible that the cheese of Leto's Joker had simply slid too far from the cracker, so to speak, when it came to his interpretation and his implementation as the DCEU's official Joker. But going back to what I asked a few moments ago, 
Could there ever really be one Joker to rule them all? One staple Joker rendition? Could there ever really be one live-action Mr. J that depicts what Bill Finger, Jerry Robinson, and Bob Kane had originally intended? Some claim that this greatest of all time live-action crown belongs to Jack Nicholson. Others say Heath Ledger, and a lot of people even consider Joaquin Phoenix's portrayal to be the Joker to end all Jokers. But what about Jared Leto? Doesn't anyone consider his Joker to be the Joker? I don't really have an answer to this question myself. I tend to fluctuate between Nicholson and Ledger. But what I can tell you is that I have a pretty good argument that places Leto as one of the most comic book accurate versions of the character to date. No, I'm serious. This is not a joke. I'm not being facetious nor am I trying to just rile everybody up. I believe that I've constructed a very convincing presentation as to why Leto Joker may in fact be the closest on-screen adaptation of classic comic book Joker in existence. If you've stuck with me this far into the video, do yourself a favor and stick with it for just a bit longer and follow me down this rabbit hole. I promise you're going to enjoy this next part. You ready? An Established Joker Jared Leto's Joker is a villain that's already been active in Gotham City for at least two decades by the time we meet him in Suicide Squad. And obviously, he's encountered Batman on more than one occasion, going off the teeth alone, which have obviously been, for the most part, knocked out by the Cape Crusader and halfway patched up by silver fillings and crowns. He is Gotham's chief villain, and unlike other film incarnations of the character, he isn't trying to take over the city, nor is he introducing himself to the people of Gotham for the very first time. He is already in control of the city's crime syndicates. This Joker is, by hook or by crook, whether incarcerated in Arkham or back on the streets, in complete control of Gotham's underworld. Something only hinted at with Nicholson's Joker and a goal that Ledger's Joker sought but never fully obtained. Leto's Joker, on the other hand, is the ultimate Gotham City gangster, one who has long since taken over the city's mob families and street-level gangs, something extremely close to how Mr. J was first depicted back in his early years. The Correct Origin Red Hood stuff aside, Leto's Joker is visually depicted as having been created from the previously mentioned accident at Ace Chemicals. This is very much in line with the comic book origins of the Joker, and as I've said, Red Hood content aside, the fact that this version of Mr. J fell into the vat of chemicals and was left with permanently bleached skin and perpetually green hair simply adds another notch to my argument for Leto's Joker being one of comic book accuracy. We do have to give credit where credit's due, though. Nicholson's Joker was given the same predominantly accurate origin story as well, which is weird to think about since these two Jokers are the only on-screen versions born from chemicals, whereas the other two are just some guys wearing scary clown makeup, which isn't inherently a bad thing, but definitely a point to make note of. A history rooted in source material. This Joker killed Robin. Plain and simple. This harkens back to one of DC's mainstay Joker storylines, where Jason Todd, the second Robin, was beaten to death by the Joker. This brings to the forefront that this version of the Joker is a brutal killer. No matter what punches he may pull or how many smiles he may crack, this guy took a crowbar or a pipe, or whatever it was, and beat a helpless teenager to death with it. To death. We see a little more of the side of Leto Joker when he abruptly murders Common's character during the introductory club scene in Suicide Squad. Yo, Jay. <laughs> Considering the death of Robin was brought on board as an in-canon plot point for the DCEU, 
albeit off screen, there's probably a few other darker moments from the comics that have been brought over as well. Of course, we can only assume this because it hasn't been confirmed or addressed one way or the other. But considering Robin's death is canon and we haven't seen Batgirl anywhere, it's very possible that she has already been shot and paralyzed by the Joker sometime before we are first introduced to the world of the DCEU, a plot point staple from the killing joke. As previously noted, this Joker was clearly created from the accident at Ace Chemicals, and this is expanded upon during a flashback sequence within Suicide Squad, where we see him take Harley Quinn to the same chemical plant to propose her own rebirth and see to it that she's reborn in the same chemically altered way. Also previously mentioned are Leto's Joker teeth, which have been knocked out and broken at some point in the past from a previous run-in with the Batman, something that has happened in the comics, and hence why in Suicide Squad, the broken sections have been filled in or replaced by silver caps. So, when you step back and take a look, almost everything about this version comes right out of the literature. From his run-ins with Batman, his stints at Arkham Asylum, the fact that he's King Boss of Gotham City, these all make for a well-established villain, one with a history rooted deeply in the lore and violence of the source material. So, with that said, what do you think? Can you pick up what I'm putting down? I think I made my point, one way or the other. But before we end this, I have a few more points to make. That's right, we aren't done yet. These next few points of interest, while not enforcing my Leto is the most comic book accurate Joker rhetoric, are still noteworthy aspects of the DCEU Joker, and I feel that they reinforce his status as such in some quite interesting ways. So, if you will once again indulge me, I'll get right to it. His Relationship with Harley Quinn Now, this is a dynamic in the film where things were slightly altered from both the 1992 animated series and the comics that followed thereafter. For those familiar with the Batman mythos, we know that Harley Quinn did not originate from the comics, but instead from the 1992 Batman the Animated Series. Much like her depiction in Suicide Squad, she was a doctor who ended up being assigned to the Joker and eventually fell in love with the Clown Prince of Crime. Their relationship was very abusive to say the least, with the Joker often degrading Harley and even striking her on occasion. When the character was finally incorporated into the comics, the abusive dynamic remained and became a staple among the pair. This was not the case for Suicide Squad, though. The relationship between the two, as it appears in the theatrical cut of the film, is one that is much more along the lines of a Bonnie and Clyde dynamic, rather than the abuser and the abused. Some speculate that there were, in fact, scenes of abuse filmed, but were later cut after test audiences didn't appreciate the violent content regarding the relationship, but this hasn't really been confirmed or denied. So in that regard, speculation doesn't really matter. What does matter though, is what's actually on the screen. And for whatever reason, the final version of Joker and Harley's relationship that we got in Suicide Squad is more of a dark and unhealthy obsession mixed with a frenetic love spectacle. And unlike the new 52 version of Harley Quinn, where she is forcibly pushed into the chemicals by the Joker, and sort of unwillingly becomes the full incarnation of Harley Quinn, the movie Suicide Squad version of Harley Quinn has an insatiable infatuation with Mr. J, which eventually leads them both to Ace Chemicals, where he was originally born. There, he gives her the choice to either accompany him and become reborn in the same way he was created, or simply go their separate ways. She, of course, decides to follow him plunging herself into the chemicals. It's her choice. And thus, for the entirety of Suicide Squad, the Joker's main cause is to get her back, no matter what. It's incredibly romantic and fascinatingly dark, and I very much prefer this version over the abusive dynamic on display in the comics and animated series. A lot of complaints about their relationship in the film is mostly from those angered by the fact that it's not one built on abuse, which from a purist standpoint, I can understand. But the film's dynamic that we did get 
just felt more compelling to me. I mean, I understand that it's Joker and Harley Quinn. I get it. Two bleached skinned psychopaths who kill people for kicks. But allowing them to be the one thing in each other's lives that is human and is something they consider untouchable not only makes the characters stronger, but it makes their craziness all the more extreme because they're willing to go to any extreme, no matter the size, for one another, regardless of the fallout or how many people have to die. Communication and Attitude Unlike the Jack Nicholson and Heath Ledger interpretations of the Joker, whom you could probably sit down in a room with and have a legitimate conversation, Jared Leto's Joker seems to be quite the opposite. This Joker not only seems devoid of the patience needed to have a full-blown conversation with somebody, but also seems to lack the understanding required to see anyone else's point of view over his own. When we see him in Suicide Squad, if he's not directly communicating with Harley Quinn herself, then he seems completely detached, frenzied, and almost as if in a perpetual drug-induced haze. When he's speaking with Monster T, he's not talking with him, he's talking at him. When he's having a conversation with Johnny Frost, he's barely paying attention. When he's interrogating Griggs, he's not looking at him, he's looking through him. This Joker is simply not there, not present, except when it comes to Harley Quinn. She always has his full attention. Whether this is really how this version of the Joker behaves, or if it's some kind of put-on to help further the scope of his reputation in Gotham City, Leto's Joker seems to be enraptured with his occupation as a psychotic gangster and crime lord, one that just happens to have green hair and bleached skin, a physical choice he didn't choose for himself, but one he's embracing to the fullest in order to get what he wants and keep his underworld in line. There's something wrong with him, he knows there's something wrong with him, and he instead chooses to use it as a tool, rather than an ailment, which makes him incredibly dangerous to everybody around him. Dress Code The Joker of the DCEU is an avid fan of fashion, and it's heavily on display in Suicide Squad. From golden jackets to black tuxedos to purple gator skin trench coats, Leto's Joker is a fashion victim of the strangest of sorts. The gold chains, the earrings, the bracelets, these are additives used to help Gotham's biggest crime lord resemble something along the lines of the drug lords seen in so many modern TV shows, movies, and weirdly, real life. Many people tend to attribute these additions to the ruin of Leto's Joker, claiming the Joker doesn't care that much about fashion jewelry, etc. But I would contest that argument altogether. Find me a storyline, besides the recent death of the family arc, where the Joker isn't a complete fashion guru. I mean, look at some of these stylistic choices. He's always had a special soft spot for his lavish and expensive purple suits, coats, hats, and that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Joker fashion. He's the DCEU's most notorious gangster, and in that regard, he's got a lot to live up to, aesthetically, when it comes to the underworld he resides within, resembling something more in line with the well-dressed and elegant drug lords of Narcos and Scarface than he is with a street-level thug or even a modern-era American mobster. Could they have gone the classic route? Sure. Would it have worked? Absolutely. But even with this abrupt change in visual appearance regarding his choices of clothing, the fact that the Joker is an avid proponent of fashion hasn't changed. It's just that the classic version chose to dress like a mobster, while Leto's Joker chose to dress like, well, Spring Break. <laughs> the Tattoos As with the gold chains and jewelry, the tattoos were an attempt by DC and David Ayer to bring the Joker into the modern era of crime and what current era crime lords may look like. Although the tattoos are a bit too on the nose for my taste, they each are meant to help reinforce this version of the Joker's story, with one example being damaged tattooed on his forehead, which is probably the tattoo that gets mocked the most by Batman fans. 
Within the context of the story, the Joker got this tattoo during one of his Arkham Asylum stints, doing so to remind Batman of the long-lasting damage the caped crusader has done to his face. According to David Ayer, the Joker had a message for the Bat, saying, quote, I was beautiful and you damaged me, end quote, alluding to the fact that the Batman knocked out his teeth. The other tattoos are simply there to embrace his Joker identity, such as Joker written across his stomach or the teeth tattooed across his hand. Again, fans are divided on the tattoos, but I personally think they work perfectly with this rendition of Mr. J, even if they are a bit too on the nose. All right, there's my spiel. What do you think now? Do you feel the same? Do you feel differently? Do you like Jared Leto's Joker more? Do you like him less? I really dig Jared Leto Joker. And again, while I can understand everyone's problem with this incarnation, Jared Leto Joker is for better or for worse the DCEU's official Joker, at least as of right now. Who knows what they're planning at this point. But uh, I think the biggest problem for a lot of people was that we just didn't see enough of him in Suicide Squad to really get the proper feel for the interpretation. But from what we did see, I thought he was a great amalgamation of both classic and new 52 Joker. Frenetic, abstract, weird, and so on and so forth. Perhaps a little too spring break, but a fitting Joker for that version of Gotham nonetheless. So with that said, do you wish they had done more of a classic approach to the Joker in the DCEU from the get-go? Especially considering Batflex's version of Batman was almost totally Frank Miller Batman? Or do you like the grungy drug lord Joker we did get? Let it be known in the comments below. So, I want to thank all of you for watching this video. And I really hope... Hey, wait a minute. We didn't talk about Jared Leto Joker's return in Zack Snyder's Justice League, did we? No, we didn't. That has to be addressed. Think you have time to listen to me ramble for another 30 minutes or so? No? Well, alright. I guess it makes more sense to give Justice League Joker his own video anyway. So yeah, we'll put a pin in that for now. So again, thanks for watching. Thanks for indulging me as I rambled on and on. I hope I made you think a little bit regarding Leto's Joker. Let me know in the comments below what you thought. Be sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel. And be sure to hit that bell too so you see notifications for the channel whenever I post something new. Also. Let me know in the comments below what you thought of Leto's Joker, and did you prefer his depiction in Suicide Squad or Justice League more? Go buy some Batman comics and see for yourself how comic booky Jared Leto's Joker really is. Do it. I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.